Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks very much for coming to hear our presentation this afternoon. Um, the Ahmed Iqbal Race Relations Resource Centre and Education Trust is um, essentially a specialist library on race, diversity, um, and migration. We are part of the University of Manchester, um, but we're based at Manchester Central Library, so in the public library here in Manchester. Um, and alongside our collections work, we um, have always done community heritage work, community heritage projects. So the um, title of our presentation is Coming in from the Cold, Narrowing the Gap Between Community Engagement and Collection Development. Um, so Coming in from the Cold is also the name of a piece of research we've recently completed, um, looking at the relationship between, among other things, um, community heritage projects and heritage collections. And so it's some of the insights from this that we're going to share with you today. Um, I was the research associate on Coming in from the Cold, and it was a project that took place between February and August 2017, and was essentially an audit of black and Asian minority ethnic focused heritage projects that have happened across Greater Manchester between 2000 and the present. Um, we undertook this research to find out more about the scope of projects, who'd been involved and why they were motivated to do so, what's happening to the research um, that's taking place and the outputs that are generated through those projects and the impact on museum, library and archive collections and we were doing that because we wanted to help to be a catalyst in generating further material, if, we, if at all possible. We did it with a grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. We've um, been lucky enough to host several projects ourselves that were also funded by the Heritage Lottery, some of which I've been lucky enough to manage. So we had some expertise in that area and a knowledge of the field already. Um, and this research phase was um, part of a much bigger plan that we have to help develop and support project work with groups um, across Greater Manchester in order to increase diversity in the city's archives. So um, the key finding from the research that we did was very simple, um, and this is it. Um, funding for black and Asian minority ethnic community-led heritage projects has increased since 2000, but their visibility has not. So they tend to be quite temporal projects that focus on engagement. Just to clarify that our definition of community-led project is a project run by people who aren't heritage professionals but are engaged in heritage activities. So for example, some of the projects were run by welfare organizations and others were run by housing associations, writing groups, faith communities, and similar kinds of organizations working in, in a community setting. So out of that research, we generated more questions <laughs> um, to help us formulate the next bit of our project. And we want to share some of that with some of the learning with you today. And um, the three questions that we're going to address specifically are what happens to the outputs of community led heritage projects? Why are they so rarely accessioned into registered collections? And can we create a model for projects that benefits both communities and collecting organisations? Again, just to clarify, I want to say that by outputs, we mean both the physical outputs of a project, so research material, publications, film, photographs and ephemera, that sort of thing, as well as temporal things such as events, performances, websites and exhibitions. So what happens to the outputs of community-led projects? Our research showed that of the 97 projects that we managed to contact, just 36 confirmed that they donated material to a museum, library or archive, which means that um, a large number of projects had no long-term le legacy or visibility. This kind of reflects the fact that funders place a lot of emphasis on engagement, but also kind of shows that record keeping and collecting are kind of sometimes secondary. Um, we personally believe that the two are intrinsically linked and we're going to explain a bit more about how that works in our organisation later. Um, 
we also found that material stays in house quite a lot. So people collect boxes of stuff, it's in their office, in a desk drawer. Um, and often it's really well known by the project worker on that project. And because the funding's temporary, that person leaves, nobody knows what's in the box or what the relevance of that material is. We also found that original research materials often discarded in favor of output. So people collect interviews, they scan photographs for publications, but they don't keep the raw material and see a value in that. So we end up with a nice glossy publication, but none of the original research. Um, we found that there's no record of temporal outputs, so communities are busy engaging, they're not busy documenting that engagement, so quite often there's no evidence of that. And there's also an over-reliance on online platforms as a kind of means to an end. People think that by putting things on YouTube, they're kind of preserving it forever, but they're kind of not necessarily considering the long-term management of that um, material or the fact that it can become out of date quite quickly or is vulnerable to potential misuse. So the second question that came out of our research was why are these outputs rarely accessioned into registered collections? It's quite a complex picture, but there's a lot of points and they're all kind of interconnected. The first point is a lack of awareness. So Quite often, relationships aren't established. Collecting organisations don't know what's happening in their borough and what community groups have in mind for projects, whereas communities are unaware of collecting organisations or why establishing contact might be a beneficial thing to do. So we found that only 32% of the community-led projects confirmed that they'd uh, had a, an active heritage partner, so they may have saw a letter of recommendation when they made their application, but only 32% followed that up with an active kind of partnership. And we believe there's a lot more potential for developing, um, for developing those partnerships going forward. Um, the second point was a lack of diversity. So 50% of museums, libraries and archives reported that they had no BAME-related collections. Um, and because there's a lack of uh, BAME, related material they were getting low numbers of audiences as well and people were less engaged we believe that that figure is probably higher but because of historic cataloging those collections are invisible and also that again staff changes mean that the kind of collections aren't as kind of well known to the staff that were reporting to us as perhaps they might have been the fourth point was incompatibility um, this is often this is to do with what communities and organisations value, and they're slightly different. So a lot of communities were speaking to themselves, to different generations within their own community, about what they felt was important to pass on in terms of their own culture and traditions. But that's quite niche and kind of difficult to sell to an organisation that's tied to a collecting policy. So quite often the institutions were refusing donations when they were approached with them at the end of projects. Um, also communities weren't considering how to reach wider audiences as well as kind of making connections with existing collections. And lastly, there were different ways of working. So both sectors vary quite a lot in their time scale, the timescales, budgets, and priorities that they work to. So there's a bit of mismatch between communities' expectations and the organization's expectations. We found that a large, uh, a significant proportion of projects included an oral history element, so 38%. And we believe that's because it's accessible. It's a kind of immediate, thing to be able to reach. It's easy to collect without very much equipment or funding, and it stands in place where there's an absence of material culture, so, so it's quite relevant to a lot of the community groups. Um, the types of material range from short vox pops to full life story interviews, and the end products were audio and audio visual files through to publications, digital stories, animations, and documentaries. But yet there are a lot of inconsistencies in how stories are collected and catalogued and how these are shared as well. So some organizations accession oral histories as objects in their own right. Others collect them as additional interpretation for physical objects. 
and oral history is also collected for the purposes of exhibition and then often discarded at the end of the exhibition. So most museums in Greater Manchester don't collect oral history, but some of the local authorities have an agreement with their partnered archives. <laughs> And until recently, donations used to be signposted to the Northwest Sound Archive, but since its closure, there's a lot of confusion across the, um, the region about what to do with that material um, subsequently. Okay, so the third um, question we're going to look at is um, this idea of creating a model for projects that will benefit um, both communities and collecting institutions. Um, so if we're successful in getting the funding for the second phase of the Coming In From The Coal project, that is going to be a three-year programme of work um, that will allow us um, essentially to fill some of these gaps and address some of these issues that Jenny's just outlined that we found in phase one. So in part, this will include carrying out targeted heritage projects um, with underrepresented groups, but also developing some best practice guidelines and models um, that we can roll out to the sector. So, you know, how to run projects that achieve meaningful engagement, but also create historically significant outputs. So um, as an organization, we have a little bit of um, expertise to draw on here. Um, so we're actually, we're an organization of two halves with the Ahmedit Balullah Race Relations Resource Center and Education Trust. So the Education Trust carries out community heritage, among other work, carries out community heritage projects. Um, the outputs of those projects are accessioned into the resource center collections, where they form the basis of future engagement work. So it's, um, it's kind of a cyclical approach, really, to community engagement and collection development. Now, um, this is by no means a kind of perfectly formed, um, smooth running model of working. Um, we still have got a lot to learn, and it's something we want, we're hoping to develop um, over the next three years. Um, but I'm just going to share with you now some of the principles that we work to on the project side and the kind of the archiving side of our work and how we can. Um, to refer back to the name of our presentation, how we try to narrow the gap between these two areas of our work. Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, some of the key principles that we kind of have developed for running heritage projects. Um, the first one of these, and it's, it's absolutely the, the headline really, is um, developing relationships. So it sounds really obvious, but I think it's very easy to underestimate the amount of time um, that needs to go into developing um, a relationship with a community group that, that we want to work with. Um, so as a heritage organisation, we can't expect to go into a community and immediately start collecting oral histories and carrying out interviews. Have to spend um, a significant amount of time building a relationship, building trust, identifying um, sort of mutual benefit um, for, in the project. So for each project, we will identify um, a community partner, so a community partner organization, and really build time into the project to get to know them, um, to do any capacity building, help them with any capacity building work, um, establishing a joint steering committee. So an um, example of this is our last major heritage lottery funded project. Um, we partnered with Anana, which is the uh, Manchester Bangladeshi Women's Organization. And um, they were really instrumental, not only in in steering the project, um, but also acting as a, a bit of a gateway to the wider Bangladeshi community, uh, helping us to identify participants and to navigate some of the cultural differences. Um, so just one very small example of this, um, they helped us to uh, sort of rethink some of our reminiscent sessions that we plan to run because um, it turns out there isn't a word for reminiscence in Bengali. So um, they helped us to rethink how to sort of manage some of those sessions. So that really leads into the second sort of principle, which is um, this idea of needing to build in flexibility so that you can really respond to the needs of project partners and project participants in the communities that you're working with. Um, as we were collecting material for, for the last project with the Bangladeshi community, um, it turned out that Anana had a really large organizational archive that was um, just languishing in a damp cupboard. Um, so, Collecting this archive wasn't a core bit of the project, but it was something that through the course of the project we realized was extremely important. Um, so this became a bit of a, a kind of a parallel project. Um, so it really requires us as project leads to relinquish a bit of control over some of the projects and let a bit of kind of serendipity um, lead the way. Third principle is um, taking a professional approach to oral history. So as Jenny outlined before, oral history is popular because it's accessible, it's quite easy, it's quite cheap. 
Um, but there are also some quality and ethical standards that need to be really rigorously observed. Um, so we ensure that our interviewees, there's one right there on the slide, um, are properly trained in taking oral histories. And on the other side, the inter sorry, interviewers are properly trained. Interviewees um, um, are fully aware of the implications of giving us an oral history. Um, and finally, the creating an understanding of archival needs and standards <coughs> from the start of a project. So this is about thinking about a project in terms of creating material for the historical record from the beginning, as opposed to archiving the project outcomes just as a, a thing that happens at the end. Um, so this, again, is about being very open with your community partners about um, what's a valuable historical document and what isn't. Um, I know with the Anana archive, Jenny spent a lot of time working with Anana um, on their appraising the material, um, identifying what would have historical value and what would be better off staying within the organization. And sometimes before this, some communities we work with don't have a particularly good understanding of what an archive is. So we may need to do visits, handling sessions. Um, so key principles for collection development. Um, and this is about carrying through those principles of relationship building and flexibility into the, the archiving and the collection management side of the work. Um, so an iterative approach to appraisal and documentation. Um, we find that when um, project material comes into the archive, because we're quite close to it, it can take us a while to reconceptualize it as, archive, as an archive as opposed to sort of the story of the project. Um, so um, this involves quite a lot of dialogue between the collection staff and the project staff um, to identify sort of what the stories are that the material is telling beyond the story of the project. Um, so we end up with a lot of iterations of kind of the catalogue um, as we try to kind of reach that balance. Um, connected to this is the idea of capturing um, what I describe as soft metadata. So um, often material collected in a project will have significance beyond um, what you can see at face value. Uh, and it's very important that this is captured in the documentation. So one example of this is uh, we had a donation of newspapers from an individual about a racist attack that took place in Manchester. Now, the newspapers were largely held by Manchester Central Library, which is where we're based. So um, we wouldn't look, an archivist looking at our collecting policy wouldn't, would think, wouldn't think to keep them. Um, however, the stories, the newspapers told a personal um, perspective on this story. <laughs> a personal perspective that was backed up by an oral history that we'd collected. So it was very important to us to keep this material. Um, so these are this sort of, um, yeah, this soft metadata, these significances beyond the, um, the obvious. It's important that we capture those during the project, but also um, in the, the ongoing, in the catalog for the longer term. Um, I think we're getting a bit short of time, so I'll just, um, so controlling levels of access, this is just about being very, um, I say we had an ethical approach to collecting oral histories, so we also have an ethical approach to um, how we collect and provide access to them. So we'll provide access to our oral histories in three different ways. We'll have the audio recording, which is in the archive. Um, researchers can look at these on request in the search room, no copying is allowed. Um, and in some cases, um, interviews might be closed for a period of time if the interviewer has, um, instead the interviewee has disclosed something that they, they would, wouldn't they don't want to be immediately um, accessed. Um, we create written summaries. So these are agreed with the interviewee, and these are made available in our library. And um, then we might also create a number of extracts. So these are short um, quotes. Again, these are agreed by the interviewee, and, and these are things that we might use in exhibitions um, or on social media. And just the final point is about creating visibility. So it's not just about collecting this material, it's about then making it visible and creating ongoing engagement with the history. Um, so through digital exhibitions, social media, that sort of thing. It's the sort of thing we're really well placed to do um, at Manchester Central Library, which is great. Um, so there are a number of challenges we face um, with this approach. Um, just to highlight a couple of them, um, a large amount of proje project material is born digital, so and this very much connects to the temporal and temporary outputs of projects. So things like photographs, film material, websites, um, tweets, these sorts of things are becoming increasingly important um, outputs of projects. 
Um, and we, we do have some digital preservation um, expertise in our organization. Um, and we do have some policies around this, but um, it's still a very new area. It's a very steep learning curve. And we find that the, um, the workload can be very unpredictable. Um, and sort of the flip side of that is the digital access. So there's a um, real expectation on us to make particularly the oral history material more widely accessible to people who can't, for instance, come to Manchester or perhaps for purposes other than um, academic research. Um, but as I said, we have like a real duty of care towards the interviewee and their wishes. Um, and we don't always know the implications of making this material available um, on online platforms, particularly kind of new and emerging ones. Um, so we're still, that's an issue that we're still, we're still grappling with. So I just want to reiterate really our point um, and our hopes for the next phase of the project, which is that better engagement leads to better collections, lead, lead, which leads to better kind of research material. And um, it hopefully is a model that we can adopt and follow.